believing that Matthew wrote in Hebrew puts me in a camp often called traditionalist. It means that I take the church fathers seriously in what they say and don't disregard what they have to tell us about the first days of the church. This isn't to say that I follow them unfailingly, though. My only allegiance is to the truth. When the evidence starts to stack up against something that the church fathers said, then I feel no obligation to follow them in their error. It's easy to look at the church fathers that I quote as part of my defense for Matthew in Hebrew. Note that they also say that Matthew was written first, and presume that I follow them there as well. This isn't true. I fully expected it to be true, but it isn't. In 2020, when I wrote out my 2021 schedule to build my best defense for Matthew in Hebrew for 2022, I would have put myself into that camp. I hadn't really looked into the question particularly, but the traditional answer had served me so well so often that I was not apt to dismiss the thought without evidence. As I investigated the question, things changed. There was actually a fair bit of evidence that Mark borrowed from Matthew. To be sure, most of the evidence that is offered to say that Matthew borrowed from Mark can go either way. The YouTube channel Faith Because of Reason has a playlist disputing Mark and Priority that demonstrates how often these pieces of evidence could go either way. To give a simple example without nuance, if we see that Matthew 4 verses 18 to 22 is a near exact match for Mark 1 verses 16 to 20, that doesn't tell us who wrote first. I'm also not personally driven by speculation about style improvements going from Mark to Matthew. A few of them are compelling, but a few are compelling the other way as well, and sometimes we just don't have the kind of insight we wish we did to understand these changes. Similarly, I put together some lists of sections ordered according to the Synoptic Gospels, and it makes it very clear that the common denominator between the three Synoptic Gospels is Mark. This doesn't prove that Mark came before Matthew. The suggestion that Mark summarized Matthew and then Luke expanded on Mark would explain this data. So with an overview of the evidence that doesn't compel me to abandon the traditional view in favor of the modern view, obviously something has compelled me. I am a Mark and Priorist, after all. For me, the evidence is in the text. When you read Matthew, Mark, or Luke in Greek, there are times when Jesus used alliteration to make his point. The Beatitudes were almost certainly first spoken in Greek, for example, there is a repeated P sound in Greek that doesn't exist in other languages. But that only hints at the language Jesus spoke in. Similarly, for the alliteration in Matthew 24 verse 36, it was probably spoken in Greek. But that tells us very little about which came first or what language they were written in, since it could just record Jesus' words accurately enough to translate back into Greek with the linguistic elements in play. This would be particularly true if those words were so often preserved in their original Greek in Mark and Luke already. Translating something to match that sounds better another way is easy. That there are so many of these in Hebrew, and that some of them are in places where it is a structural part of the document and not dialogue, is one of the things that draws me into thinking that Matthew was written in Hebrew. But there are a few of these in the Greek as well. In Mark 11 verse 15, there is a repeated P sound where Mark talks about Jesus turning over the money changers' tables. Και εισελθών ο Ιησούς εις το Ιερόν ήρξα το εκβάλλειν τους πολλούντας και αγοράζοντας εν το Ιερό και τας τραπέζας των πολυβιστών και τας καθέδρας των πολλούντων τας περιστεράς κατέστρεψεν και ουκήφι ενήνα της διενέγγης και ευώς διά του Ιερού. Και εδίδασκεν, λέγον αυτή, ουγέ γραπτε ότι ο οικό μου οίκο προσευχή κληθήσατε πάσιν τη έθνεση, ή μη δε επίησατε αυτών σπήλαιων ληστών. The parallel passage in Matthew 21,12 and 13 also has these repeated peace sounds. Και εισήλθεν ο Ιησού ει το ιερό του Θεού, και εξέβαλεν πάντα στου πολλούντα και αγοράζοντα εν το ιερό, και τα στραπέζα των πολυβιστών κατέστρεψεν, και τα καθέδρα των πολλούντων τα περιστερά. Και λέγει αυτή, γέγραπτε, ο οικό μου οίκο προσευχή κληθήσετε ημί δε αυτόν επίησατε σπήλαιων ληστών. Now, on the one hand, under my theory, this is an excellent example of the one who translated Matthew from Hebrew to Greek translating to match the Mark text he was familiar with. But it's more than that as well. 
Things like this aren't altogether unheard of in Mark's text. This is part of the structure of the document rather than being dialogue. And the Greek of Matthew follows the Hebrew of Matthew very closely here. There is even a Greek word borrowed from Mark here in the Hebrew. Okay, to be fair, it's actually an Aramaic word, and it isn't even an exact match for the Greek word it's matching. Greek, Lestin, versus Aramaic. Listison. And yes, the Aramaic borrowed it from the Greek. It's not a coincidence that they sound so similar. But it does leave one to wonder why Matthew would choose an Aramaic word rather than quoting the Hebrew of Zechariah directly. I think the answer is that he had a copy of Mark in front of him, and reading the text in Greek made him think of the Aramaic word rather than the Hebrew passage. Another place that the same Aramaic word appears in Hebrew Matthew is Matthew 27 verse 38, where Jesus is hung between two robbers. And again, there's a parallel in Mark 15 verse 27. There are others, also with parallels in Mark. But in Matthew 6 colon 19 and 20, and 2400 hours 43, where there is no parallel to Mark, the word used in Hebrew Matthew is Genavim. Istis. Is a word that Mark uses, and Matthew copies it with a borrowed Aramaic word. The Greek translator of Matthew mirrored this by using Kleptis. For Genav. But the fact that Listasim is used wherever there's a parallel in Mark and Genav is used where there's not seems telling to me. This may not be the only case where a structural part of Matthew and Mark work in parallel to show a probable Greek origin to the text. I have a sense that I've heard others mentioned in lectures that I've listened to, but I can't find them. This is the one that I've held into as the most obvious. The thing that's interesting to me is that they all seem to line up with places where Matthew has a parallel in Mark if they aren't in dialogue. Mark, written in Greek, then becomes the source of these texts. There are questions that come up. Why would Matthew use a Greek document when writing in Hebrew? Why would Matthew, an eyewitness, copy Mark, a second-hand witness, instead of just making his own account? Why would the early church fathers get the order of Gospels wrong? As to why Matthew would use a Greek document, I don't know, but I equally don't know why he wouldn't. We all make decisions. In order for this question to reach the level of an objection, there's going to need to be a lot more brought into it that I just haven't seen. As to why Matthew would copy from a second-hand witness, there's a lot of moving parts here. This might be evidence that Matthew the Apostle didn't actually write Matthew the Gospel, if the idea of an eyewitness resisting using second-hand witnesses as a source can be shored up a bit. It doesn't make sense to me, isn't actually evidence that this wasn't done. So if the idea that this wasn't done can't be substantiated by some kind of study, maybe Matthew had trouble formulating his thoughts and reading Mark helped. Without more information, all anyone can do is speculate. The really interesting one is that the church fathers got this wrong. Every case I'm aware of that the church fathers give an order to the Gospels, they get this wrong. They may give different ideas about the order or Matthew and Luke or Luke and Mark, but they always put Mark after Matthew. This is where I need to point out that I'm an evidentialist. I follow the evidence. The church fathers are one source of evidence but one source doesn't override all other sources of evidence. One of the things I find interesting is that a church father getting all of the dates for the writing of the Synoptic Gospels would only have to make wrong assumptions putting Matthew at the beginning of the ranges allowed by the evidence and Mark at the end of the ranges allowed to get the order they have. But someone instead assuming that Mark was written at the beginning of the ranges allowed and Matthew was written at the end of the ranges allowed would get the same order I have for these. 2. The overlap in possible times is just that flexible. To use a modern example, if I told you that I wrote something my freshman year of college, 1997 to 98 school year, and that my friend wrote something similar during the Clinton Lewinsky scandal, 1998 to 99 
then there's not really enough data to figure out which one was first. Because my time frame covers an earlier portion, it might be natural to place mine first, but the data could support either. In fact, mine was written after, and when you see that mine was a response to the one written by a friend it makes sense. But now you've got a bunch of people that made the wrong assumption based on the data they had. What we hear for Matthew's dates is that he wrote while Paul and Peter were preaching in Rome, and that it was some time before he left Jerusalem 15 years after the crucifixion, so before 48 AD. For Mark, we hear that it was before his death in 62, and probably before he settled in Alexandria. He settled in Alexandria in 50 AD. So there's plenty of room for overlap in that. It could be that an influential early thinker made the assumptions the wrong way, and everyone else just followed suit. Or it could be that the church fathers saw that the available times overlapped and gave Matthew the earlier time in honor of thinking it was written by an apostle. Or it could be that they saw the times overlap, but that the list of rulers Matthew dates by is earlier, and they just made the wrong assumption. Some are not going to like that this evidence is tied to the Hebrew Matthew. For sure, this is an evidence in favor of Hebrew Matthew. That evidence is provided in another place. If you need evidence for Mark and priority that presumes a Greek Matthew, it's out there. Most of those same points hold for Hebrew Matthew as well. Some people won't like this because it presumes and even supports the idea that Mark was written in Greek. I'm not a Hebrew roots guy, sorry. I follow where the evidence leads no matter how inconvenient that is to a particular idea. Other people aren't going to like this because it makes me hard to classify. I'm not a traditionalist because I accept Mark and priority, and I'm not a modern text critic because I accept Hebrew Matthew. If you really need a label for me, evidentialist, works. I follow the evidence, not what others with a similar idea follow. For me, the biggest point I want to make is that I'm not the kind of guy to tow the party line. I'm not going to tow the line of majority scholarship when I see stronger evidence that they've missed the mark on something. Likewise, I'm not going to commit myself to the traditionalist camp when majority scholarship has evidence to back it. I follow the evidence. I think that more people need to be more careful about what conclusions they group together. Just because it looks like the church fathers got it right, that Matthew was written in Hebrew doesn't mean that they are universally correct. Similarly, just because modern scholarship has figured out the order that the Gospels were written doesn't mean that they are universally correct. Seek the truth, always, because as someone way smarter than me once said, the truth will set you free.